Can music make a movement? This week, legendary music producer Danny Goldberg takes us back to a time when All You Need Is Love was not meant to be ironic. Danny will reflect on the 50 years since the summer of love and go in search of the lost chord, the title of his new book. Then from today's music movement scene, Alexa Garcia and Naima Penniman of Climbing Poetry talk about their new album Intrinsic and perform live in studio. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done, take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. This summer marks the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love, the hippie revolution. It's also the year that Muhammad Ali was convicted of failing to report for the draft, and Dr. King came out against the Vietnam War. In 1967, Stokely Carmichael championed black power, rebellions in Newark and Watts left those communities in flames in a time not unlike our own. The establishment was on the rocks, it seemed. But its critics spoke in no single voice. Would change come through love, through rage, through be-ins or sit-ins? Longtime music executive and author Danny Goldberg has returned to 1967 in his new book, In Search of the Lost Chord. What was lost, what was found, and why go back there? Goldberg is also the former CEO of Air America Radio and the author of Dispatches from the Culture Wars, How the Left Lost Teen Spirit. Danny, welcome back to the program. Glad to have you. Hi, thanks for having Good me. Good to see you. Were you a hippie? Do you think of yourself as having been a hippie? I, I identified with the hippies. You know, it was a funny word. It was really a media creation of some columnist in San Francisco, and, and people always had mixed feelings about calling themselves hippies at the time. But in retrospect of the different tribes, as they said, that existed, then I probably identified a little more with the hippies. I mean, than you were just others. out of high school, right? And you were an East Coaster? Yeah, yeah. I graduated from high school in 1967. That was kind of part of my idea and kind of writing the book to to do a journey to discover all the things I wasn't quite old enough to be part of, but that inspired me as a teenager. So what did the media get wrong in our understanding of hippie, that word, media creation or not? Well, I think over the years, it's become dumbed down to a kind of cartoon version that consists of just long hair on guys and slang like groovy and cool and far out and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Cheech and Chong type uh, stoners. Uh, and and those things were part of it. People did get stoned. They did, the guys did have long hair. We saw the Beatles were attractive to girls with longer hair, so we all said, Reason let's enough. try that, you know. And um, but but to me, at its core, and where the subtitle of the book is 1967 and the hippie idea, and why I coined that phrase was that behind those symbols, which very quickly became passe, co-opted by commercialism and predators, Behind it, to me, was a spiritual movement, mm -hmm. that it was a reaction against materialism. And in some part, for some people, a reaction against the religions they were born into. But to, one of the reasons to go back in time, hopefully not just nostalgia, although there are people of my generation that we do like kind of reliving those moments, is to, is to identify human things that aren't dependent on the 24-hour news cycle or the fashions of the day that, that, that are the same, really, in some ways, from decade to decade and century to century, and that ebb and flow in mysterious currents. And the idea that there was more to life than just how much money you made or what university degree you got uh, was, was a revelation to a lot of people in, in the 60s, which was coming out after all of the 50s, which were known as the sort of mad men materialistic time. And between the suspicion of authority that was bred by the war in Vietnam, which for many of us was incomprehensible, the, the upheaval involving race relations, trying to finally remedy this horrible legacy of segregation and slavery in the country, the early stirrings of feminism and the gay rights movement, which which came a little bit later in terms of the public eye, but were obviously bubbling up in the culture at that time. And the sudden availability of psychedelics, um, <laughs> It was a lot going on. Well, so that goes back to sort of what's the relevance of that moment to this one. And, and one of the things you, you didn't mention was the way that this hippie idea yeah. um, was also a reaction against, I think you describe it as the, the grim, grounded leftists of that era. Well, that's, I think that's another truth, is that the, the, there was sort of the existentialist, John Paul Sartre, Camus, uh, beatnik, black and white, ascetic, stern, um, grumpy hipness <laughs> that that was a reaction to the post-war period and right. which contributed greatly to the intellectual life of the West 
but that still felt limited to a lot of people. And one of the things about the hippie era was the embrace of joy. And yeah. the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love, was not meant ironically. It came wasn't a jingle. Right? It came out in 67. It was the first uh, satellite broadcast in history of any kind. I think a billion people saw it. And, um, uh, you know, John Lennon later said that he wrote it as propaganda, you know, no, in the same spirit that he had written Give Peace a Chance. And um, the idea that it was okay to be happy and that didn't mean you were stupid mm -hmm. was to me as a kid a revelation. And I think that the, the tension and the mixture of the left and the psychedelic movement at its best was that lost chord yeah. in my title. But those two uh, energies uh, mostly were at each other's throats. And a lot of the political people thought that anybody that was too involved with meditation or tripping was uh, uh, kind of uh, abdicating the responsibility to fix the world. And a lot of people uh, in the psychedelic world, Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead in particular, felt that the anger and polarization coming from some of the anti-war people was not actually going to solve mm -hmm. the problem. It was going to perpetuate the polarity. And the truth, in my mind, is somewhere in between. Right. And, the, and, the, and, the, and the quest is to balance these two things. You can't, as I think Joan Baez said, uh, be effectively screaming for peace through clenched teeth. Mm -hmm. That there has to be an inner peace in order to motivate others. And you can't demonize and dehumanize your opponents and expect to win. On the other hand, if you're just thinking about yourself all the time, uh, that's that's kind of ethically yeah. not okay. And what difference did race make? I mean, because the there were people inside the Black Power movement and the Civil Rights movement who didn't appreciate people talking about be-ins as opposed to sit-ins. They felt like it was some kind of white dig or just well. Um, there are people a lot smarter than me haven't been able to summarize in a few sentences right. the racial legacy of America, which is one again informed by slavery and you know legal segregation and de facto segregation and, and uh, things that go on right as we're speaking here now and unfortunately likely for some time to come. But it was not as, it was a more complicated dynamic. There were dozens of different things going on at the same time. Uh, certainly um, in the musical arena, there was more merging of black and white. Uh, you know, the Beatles and the Stones launched onto the world stage covering Marvin Gaye songs and uh, other, other R&B songs. Um, the Fillmore shows, the psychedelic shows were, were very integrated uh, because of the insistence of people like the Jefferson Airplane. There were people like B.B. King, Albert King, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, uh, Rasan Roland Kirk, Sun Ra, and many others were exposed to, you know, white hippie audiences. Otis Redding became uh, a, a massive pop star as a result of being at the, uh, at the Monterey uh, pop festival, which also happened in '67, and Sly and the Family Stone was one of the few artists that was was uh, like ambidextrous. They were played on the R&B radio stations and on the rock stations, and in Woodstock and mm. in discos. So there was there was some connectivity there in the political realm. There was a lot of uh, discussion in the black community about working with whites in general, not just right. white hippies. Uh, SNCC, which had been launched and called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, was taken over, as you said, by Stokely Carmichael, uh, replacing John Lewis. And John Lewis turned out to be the last person who ran SNCC who was committed to nonviolence. Stokely Carmichael was a great admirer of Malcolm X mm -hmm. and brought a lot of Malcolm X's ideas into SNCC. Most white board members were asked to leave. They felt for uh, self-empowerment it needed to be all black. On the other hand, the Black Panthers, who had an equally radical image and emerged onto the American stage by the end of 67 in Oakland, uh, were very uh, collaborative with, yeah. with the white uh, anti-war movement. And, and, and the Diggers, uh, yes, who were a Haight-Ashbury uh, group that was involved with experimental theater and all sorts of um, and feeding uh, people. head I trips. Mean, like the Panthers, they were also feeding people. We'll talk about, about, more about the diggers perhaps in a minute, but I did want you to address that part of the story, which is just like today, there was resistance, but there was also building. Um, building of new media, of new underground presses, of stores, of independent radio. Um, and the Diggers and the Panthers both were providing a service uh, to people in poor communities. I, I guess what, before we close, I want you to address where do you see that or do you see that happening today? And is that one of the legacies of that year too? Well, I think there are good legacies and bad legacies. 
And um, I, think, I think the good legacy is an example of people who were outsiders, whether they were black or white, uh, finding a community and finding a voice that impacted the mainstream culture. And that's inspiring uh, because sometimes the established order just seems so powerful. And today with surveillance and these gigantic multi-billion dollar companies are uh, um, intimidating. And yet there is something about the spirit of creative people and spiritual aspiration and peace and love, meant not ironically, that can make a difference. Yeah. On the other hand, the, the uh, infighting and the uh, narcissism of small difference, this idea that your particular way of fixing the world is better than anyone else's, uh, is a deadly uh, sabotage of, of accomplishing anything. And the divisions of that period, I think, gave rise to Nixon. Yeah. I think the entire drama as we speak in the, in the Trump administration about um, if the Russians influenced the election and if they did, uh, you know, would the outcome have been different? There's no question that the goal of any of those leaked emails was to get Bernie Sanders voters not to vote or to vote for third party candidates. It wasn't to change the mind of people and make them vote for Donald Trump. It was to demoralizing the opposition. It was to split the left. Now, I, I'm a Bernie Sanders guy. I, I, Hillary Clinton to me is a, a part of a corporate democratic tradition that has been better than the people they ran against, but didn't really solve the problems of millions of people and have been disappointing in many ways. But on the other hand, uh, we see that things can get worse. And I think the infighting is something to really be wary of. Che Guevara was murdered in 1967. Uh, shortly before that, he quipped, if you ask the American left to form a firing squad, they get into a circle. That's a luxury we really yeah. can't afford. The other great line of Che Guevara's though is that the true revolutionary is motivated by feelings of real love. Well, um, all you need is love, but maybe, <laughs> maybe you need more than love, but without love, hard to get anything meaningful accomplished. In Search of the Lost Chord, 1967, and the hippie idea is out now from Acacia Books. Danny Goldberg, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Soma and Nagasaki, and we will survive Palestine. We survive Vietnam and wounded knee. Rwanda and Mississippi. The 50 stripes around our stars. 50 years to life behind them. That's climbing poetry. Alexa Garcia and Naima Peniman. In just over a decade, they have become a mainstay of the movement music scene. I first saw them years ago at the first Common Bound, the conference of the New Economy Coalition, then at the Hammerstein Ballroom performing on V-Day. Earlier this year, I piled into a hot and hopping Brooklyn bar for the release of their newest album, Intrinsic. Count me among their fans, along with the likes of Angela Davis, Cornell West, and Alicia Keys. Alexa and Naima are joining us here in the studio today. I couldn't be happier. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for having us. So first, tell us about your tour. You've been out there in the world with Intrinsic. What's yeah. happening? Well, since we dropped the album with that concert you were at on March 31st, we hit the road the next day Whoa. and flew across the country. We've done a lot of tour stops on the West Coast. We hit up Minneapolis, did some stuff on the Southeast Coast. And it's been really powerful because with the album, because it was a collaboration between so many different musicians and vocalists, it's expanded what we're bringing to the stage and we've been working with local musicians and all of our tour stops bringing together bands and new configurations of collaboration. So tell me more exciting. about that. I mean, it's true. When I first yeah. saw you, it was just the two of you. Mm -hmm. and you're selling your t-shirts out front and then performing on the <laughs> stage. Now, yeah. I mean, in Brooklyn for Intrinsic, it was this stage full of artists from all over. Who are you working with? Yeah. Well, in Brooklyn, there was 25 musicians. Every single tour, and every single tour sub has been different. We've had 10 musicians out in California. We had 
four musicians or five musicians in Minneapolis, six in Portland. So we're working mostly with folks of color. We're working mostly with women, really trying to get us on the stage. You know, it's, it's rare in the music industry. And so it's been amazing. It's been phenomenal to see the work uh, re resurrect in the mouths and in the hands of other musicians, but still have a focal point. So is that the way in which this album is different or, or how would you describe the difference of this album? Yeah. The last? Yeah, well, Intrinsic is the first record we have released in a decade. Yeah. We've been so focused on what we're bringing to the stage, a lot of multimedia, spoken word and hip hop theater, and really relying on uh, our voices to bring that forward. And with Intrinsic, the breadth of collaboration is definitely a new element really helping to propel the lyricism, but the messages are the same. But we really wanted to come up with, you know, just some anthems that we can rock to for these times. You know, mm -hmm. we really need some things that motivate us and keep us inspired, keep us moving that we can rock to. Well, so talk about that. I mean, it does seem like they're, I mean, you're as feisty as ever and as defiant as ever. <laughs> and in your company, the audiences that I've been in, like, you'd think the revolution was, like, tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> it's not quite the case, though, is it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, tell me a well, bit about how you balance those two things. Mm -hmm. well, maybe I it mean, is the case. Yeah, I feel like there is an incredible... First of all, I don't believe in revolutions. Okay. I believe in solutions. I think this is a solutionary time, and we need solutionaries to come to the front. So and what's the difference? Well, I feel like revolutions tend to... Uh, hurt the people that are on top, they're usually violent, and then those people come to the bottom, become hurt, and then turn around and hurt the people on top, and it becomes a cycle of hurt. Mm -hmm. Hurt people hurt people. And we, this is a time where we really need healed people to heal people. And creativity does that. Solutions does that, you know? So how do we create a platform of imagination to really propel us forward? A unified power cannot be defeated I think it's so crucial that we remain optimistic and hopeful even in these times of deep despair with increasing layers of terror and trauma that are inflicted on our people. Like, we are very sentient to how real these pressing issues are that we're up against. We also bear witness constantly to the amazing capacity of our communities to come together. And we purposefully scour everywhere we go to find out who is doing that groundbreaking work that's really challenging these systems of oppression and really wanting to highlight those stories and bring them to the surface because we need that to stay inspired and to be able to see examples, like new models of ways we can be doing things different. Adrian Mar uh, Murray Brown talks a lot about imagining a post-oppression period mm -hmm. or imagining ourselves out of oppression. Mm -hmm. Have you accomplished that, do you think? Can, can you see it? Yeah. I what think do you say? I do. I, you know, in the, in, the, in the death of a caterpillar, you have these imaginal cells. Scientists call them imaginal cells. And the imaginal cells carry the information code for the butterfly to come. And the imaginal cells are only born in the death, in the absolute death. And I do feel like there, that we are imaginal cells, that there's imaginal cells everywhere coming up in the process of this death that we are experiencing. And we all have the information code for what's to come. The caterpillar never knew that it would fly. It doesn't even understand what flight is. We don't understand what's coming. We don't know it. But the environmental catastrophe that we're facing is going to force us, is going to propel us into something that we can't even see. And I think right now there's a lot of folks everywhere just holding different parts of what this new story is going to be. Right now, I feel like the biggest battle is the battle of narratives and what is the stories that are going to be on Earth. Mm -hmm. There's one story that colonization has brought forth and has said, this is the story and we are all following this story. And that's one of its biggest mm -hmm. tools. So how do we bring the multiplicity and the, di I don't like the word diversity, but the multiplicity of stories to the surface so that it, our survival can be this collective one. And it, within those stories, I feel like we have the information on how to move forward. Mm -hmm. I just came back from Europe mm. where I was so struck by the 
consciousness that I saw amongst everybody of both climate mm -hmm. crisis and also war yeah. and the refugees that are coming to the shores of Europe. We're not even feeling that mm. at the, in the way that they are. Mm -hmm. But mm. the flip side of it was I was in Greece that a lot of people there were really depressed. They were discouraged because of the failure of the Syriza government. Mm. And they were finding inspiration in the migrants and refugees who were coming from Syria and from mm. Eastern Africa and from Afghanistan. And I said, you know, you're the cheeriest people I've met. <laughs> and I wonder the degree to which you, what we just heard, consciously references Palestine, Rwanda, you're placing us in the world. Mm -hmm. The left in this country, protest movements here have become pretty insular, mm -hmm. not that connected yes. to global politics. And that's Are you dangerous. Yeah, I think that's dangerous. And I think, I think when we were talking about intersectionality earlier, you know, it's essential that we see the intersections between water and violence against women and mountaintop removal and the, poli and the police brutality and mass incarceration. They're all systems that, they're a triangulation of oppression that continue uh, from this process of colonization into what now is globalization. And so how do we how do we come together across our difference, I think is the biggest thing. And within our movements, how do we not break each other down before we lift each other up? Mm. There's a lot of self-criticism in our movements right now, and I feel like there's a lot of detriment in that. We're using the divide and conquer process within ourselves. It's like there's a deep healing that needs to happen, a deep, deep healing. Uh, and I think that's our, our very next big, big step, you know, in order to move forward in any holistic way. Mm -hmm. Intrinsic has lots of great music to dance to, but you and you also, I shouldn't say but, and you also have a lot of music that teaches us about connections. And mm. sometimes your work does require like a lot of references. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. How do they not become overwhelming? Like that I'm always thinking like we painted this connected picture, mm -hmm. which is right, mm -hmm. but then it almost, almost becomes a challenge. Well, if it's all connected, where do I start? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a little bit about the concept of the album, Intrinsic, where we recognize that every individual part of a whole system contains the whole right. and the part is essential to it, you know? And I think even when we dilate and examine this big web of interconnected, interdependent reality, that it doesn't become our job to then heal every point of intersection on that web. It actually supports us in knowing that when we become the most effective healer, transformer, change maker, visionary around the area of influence with the community that we're most accountable to, that we belong to, that we're responsible for, that it is actually part of helping to heal that whole web when we all are doing that, you know, and that it's not a separate process, that it is actually one woven tapestry that we're helping to heal. So it is about that awareness that is so expansive, but that doesn't and so it doesn't mean we ignore what's happening in Sudan. It doesn't mean we ignore what's going on in Alaska. Um, but we can be focused in these ways, um, really recognizing with that awareness um, where we can make the most impact where we're at. Beautiful. Well, we're going to hear a poem without your 25 musicians, unfortunately. <laughs> um, check out Intrinsic People if you haven't yet. We'll put a link on our website. What do you want to perform for us? I would love to share an excerpt from a piece we call Awakening. Whoever told you you can't fly was afraid of heights you reach if you tried. You better free your mind before they illegalize thought. There's a war going on. The first casualty was truth and it's inside you. The universe is counting on, on our belief, belief that, that faith is more powerful than fear. And in that shifting moment, moment we'll all remember why we're here in a world you're assassinated for having a dream. dream. And the rich spend nine billion a year to control our ideas and visions are televised. So things aren't what they seem. We gotta believe in a world where there's room enough for everyone to breathe. We were born right now for, for a reason. reason. We can be whatever. whatever. We give ourselves the power to be. And right now we need dream weavers, bridge builders, truth sayers, light bearers, food growers, wound healers, trailblazers, life lovers, peace makers. 
give what you most deeply desire to, to give. give every moment you are choosing to live or you are waiting why would a flower hesitate to open now is the only moment raindrop let go become the ocean possibility is as wide as the space we create to hold it we were born right, right now, now for a reason. reason. Our words are the water. Reshaping rocks. Our actions are sledgehammers to apartheid. Blocks our dreams are the keys. To prison guards lost. Our consciousness a collection of, of awakening thoughts that decided one day to release all the fear we were taught and give in to, to love. love. Unfiltered like sun to the dawn. Unconditional Mother to, to sun. Unexpected. Expected the enemy who put down his gun against the command that hailed from above a peace prayer the shout of thousands of drums. The power of the people is the power of us.